Subhash Chandra Bose was actually thrown out of the presidentship of the Congress party. But Subhash Chandra Bose really... Why should the Subhash Bose statue facing parliament be controversial? It is only controversial to the British. So Subhash Chandra Bose and his brother Sarath Chandra had a huge sort of quarrel within the Congress party. Their battle really was with Gandhi, Patel and Nehru. Subhash Bose escaped from his British captor's clutches, travelled via the land route, went all the way to Europe, met the enemy's enemy, so to speak. And there also, the meeting didn't go very well. The British, even today, don't want us to valorise Savarkar, Khudiram Bose, Norobindo, you know, all the great revolutionaries of India. Mm. They don't want us to care about this history. They want a history where and they were building railways for us. And at some point, we protested, and then we made some salt, and. Lo behold, independence was given to us. That's really not true. So let's let's uncover the the violent, unheard side of India's freedom struggles because I think Hindal, thank you so much for making the time in extremely busy times in your life as they are always to come and speak with me. No, I'm always happy to come and talk to you. How are you? I am doing excellent. And uh, how's your stint in Bombay? My stint in Bombay is excellent. I am tasting all the I-N-D-E-P-N-E -E, -E, spelling of independence. Okay. Um, really enjoying it. But so I want to... Growing up years. Huh? Yeah, I want to speak to you about independence because I think when I was growing up, like I mentioned, yeah. my parents instilled patriotism as I, as I know the value now in, yeah. in me. Through music, yeah. through songs, through having us stand up for the national anthem. It, the patriotism... Patriotism was something that was all around me at all times, right? The Indian flag, all of that. I think as time has gone on, and maybe because of social media and the expansion of other narratives and just the busyness of people's lives, independence as a concept is 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 a is a blur. It's a it's a dwindling idea, right? We are nationalistic more than we are patriotic, right? So for context, we used to be a British colony, right? How do you think this idea of independence has changed from that time, even when you were growing up, to where we are, we are where we are now? No, I think certainly uh, in post-colonial nations, uh, to begin with, there is a lot of enthusiasm, you know, because there's been a long time that people have been under colonial yoke and so on and so forth, right? So the initial years, the you know that enthusiasm sort of percolates and it sort of it creates a sort of civic nationalism, right? A civic sense of patriotism that percolates everywhere. But, you know, in India, as in many other post-colonial countries, uh, there's always been a sense that this patriotism is very good, but it also runs side by side with a lot of fundamental problems that we've had in terms of poverty, in terms of, you know, lack of jobs, in terms of a lot of lack of material benefits, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, that began to change in 1991, and now we're in 2024, and the economic liberalization came and it opened up the economy. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm certainly a child of liberalization. You know, everything I've done in my life, I have only been able to do because liberalization opened the doors. If it was a closed economy, I think my life would have been very different. Today, 2024, I think one of the challenges we have is that prosperity has really spread. But we are 1.5 billion people. For it to touch every life, it'll take time. So, uh, you know, the percolation of that wealth and prosperity, mm. that is taking time. Though, of course, most people would say what their lives were 20 years, 30 years ago to today, there's been a sea change. Mm. On very basic things, you know, our electricity network is better than ever before. You know, most parts of the country today have electricity. Now, whether they get 24-hour un uninterrupted electricity or not is a different question. Right, but they do have electricity. The connection and the mm. connectivity is there. Uh, our sanitation problem has, you know, vastly improved. Our road network has vastly improved. Uh, all kinds of things has vastly improved. Right. Mm. Uh, however, we still have considerable problems in the percolation of that prosperity across the board, and I think that's why a lot of people feel that you know, this independence and patriotism is all very well, but my life has to improve even further, mm. right? And certainly one of the problems we have is economic freedom, which can only come if people have good jobs. Now, it's a very complicated question on how many jobs do we actually create, you know, 
what kind of jobs are actually required i think india has you know as my friend manish sabarwal often says india the problem is not unemployment it's underemployment in the sense that there are jobs enough for everyone but not the kind of jobs that people want many of them mm. at the pay scale that they wanted so everyone can get a 10000 15000 rupee job but you know once you start to aim higher once you want you know sort of quasi white collar jobs once mm. you want jobs that pay a lot more that then becomes a problem mm. so rather than unemployment we have a problem of underemployment so all of this is a very complicated story having said all of this though i am one of those people who still believes that the sense of patriotism and nationalism is very important for us you know uh my friends in the left would say nationalism is terrible and this that and the other and they are wrong let me explain to you why they are wrong the europeans you know look at other parts of the world and say oh nationalism is a bad thing but they think nationalism is a bad thing because of their experience what is their experience remember you in europe they fought for hundreds of years where different parts of europe fought one another you know before the treaty of westphalia which then created these nation states based on common culture common language common culture common religion and so on and so forth right and then they of course had that nazi experience right fascism therefore they think patriotism and nationalism is a bad thing mm. whereas for a post colonial country we wouldn't even exist if we didn't have patriotism and nationalism so mm. i don't think we can listen to the west on this we have our own indigenous experience and i still think nationalism and patriotism is very very important for india because we still have parts of india you know when india became independent when amra one of the biggest questions was will india survive intact geographically mm. because already at the very act of independence a large part of india had broken away you know pakistan west pakistan east pakistan right uh, east pakistan of course later became bangladesh but uh, there was a lot of question mark of whether other parts of india would break away and certainly in the south there was separatist you know tendencies or based on language in the east there were separatist uh, tendencies because of other things then hmm. of course we saw the khalistan movement so there were a lot of question marks whether india would break up i actually think we still need about maybe 20 or 30 years more where we come to about say 5000 or 10000 dollars per capita mm. where our sovereignty questions would be sorted even today look at the situation we are in on the western border pakistan is you know a defunct state correct we have no idea what's going to happen to pakistan bangladesh which used to be stable big question mark the entire northeastern border myanmar with the northeast of india big question mark civil war is happening civil war is happening the junta as of yesterday news is that they don't even control large parts of the country maybe the north and so on and so forth right then the china border big question mark so we have a lot of problems on sovereignty and we must instill the values of patriotism in our country people and you know people even younger than you and me to ensure that they carry forward this idea that india is something worth defending bharat is worth defending bharat is worth loving with all its imperfections this is home this is our motherland and we must protect it this is a very very important idea mm-hmm. and this entire woke agenda in the west to say oh there are no borders there's nothing that the west will pay a price for this mark my words Mm. already in large parts of the west the problems have you know are reaching reaching yeah. a certain you know spain, level spain france germany yeah, spain the UK. france germany uk america also mm. right they will pay a price for this kind of ideology mm. we must never go down that path we must protect our motherland we must protect our you know great culture it's a very ancient old culture it belongs to all of us no matter what language what religion which part of india you come to come from this entire heritage is yours and we must do a lot more to tell people and explain to younger people that this is your heritage too and you must do what you can to protect it how i have literal goosebumps with the last thing that you said because this idea of having become independent has sort of been lost over time because we've like you said moved on to more putting in questions around our economics around employment and all of that and uh, how can possibly younger people find a thread that is common with the people who got us our independence 
and we were a colony of the British, a yes. slave to our colonial masters. Yes. Um, how can we find a, a thread that binds us to them? Because I think the last time I read about independence was in school, where I would read these Nita Mehta publication books that would have one pagers on every independence, uh, every freedom fighter that you could possibly imagine in India. But then as I grew up, I started to focus more on current issues. I started to focus on politics, on nationalism. And the idea of patriotism seemed somehow to be contained in the past, in 1947. Uh, history to be read, but not to be remembered. How can people bridge that gap? You know, I think one of the most important things that uh, one needs to, you know, really teach people, educate people, is that no matter where you come from in India and what your religion is and what language you speak and so on and so forth, there is a common thread that binds us. What is that common thread? There is a common culture that has, that we have inherited, right? A common wisdom mm. that India gave the world some of the most greatest literature, la, um, scientific achievements, literature, architecture, food, music, all of this is our common heritage. It doesn't matter whether you're Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, whatever you are. This is your common heritage. And when you use that heritage in your everyday life, mm. it can transform your life for the better. And there are umpteen examples of this, right? I'll give you one example. If you look at architecture in India, right? India has some of the most incredible architectural heritage in the world. And it has had this architectural heritage, you know, from the time of the Cholas, you know, who built the great, you know, temples of the South uh, to the, you know, to the sort of Mughal Rajput era where, you know, great palaces were built to the entire colonial period. You look at our entire heritage. There is a tremendous architectural heritage treasure trove that has been given to us and that belongs to everybody mm -hmm. what about food we are you know i often like to say in many of our lectures you know the west talks about vegan and veganism and so on and so forth india is the world's greatest place for vegan food if you really if the future is vegan then the future is indian mm -hmm. you know there is no place in the world which is better vegetarian and better vegan food than India. Agreed. Right? But that's a common heritage once again. It doesn't matter which sect you're from, which religion you're from, where you come from, what language you speak. It's a common heritage, right? Mm -hmm. In At least till my father's generation, Indians were naturally bilingual or trilingual. They wrote and spoke in multiple languages. It's only with my generation and younger that people started to become this monolinguistic uh, uh, or monolinguist, so to speak. Right. Whereas their only language they truly seem to have is English, if they come from an English medium, so to speak, background. But that is worth destroying, in my opinion. We should go back to an era where Indians should be able to read, write in more than one language. Of course, mm -hmm. you should keep English. English is, you know, in English has also become an Indian language. Mm -hmm. But there should be at least one or two languages that you can effortlessly read and write in. Yeah, I've met many friends from the South who can speak Tamil, Telugu, Marathi, yeah. Hindi and English. I think one of the tragedies of uh, being a Northerner is that you assume that all you got to le learn is Hindi and English, and English and that should be enough. But you also miss out on the polyglot benefits of having a mind exactly. that can comprehend the world through different languages. And imagine if you were, as, as a Northerner, as you said, if you were to learn even a rudimentary Tamil, imagine the universe that will open up to you. Right. Mm -hmm. If you learn the rudimentary, if you even learn rudimentary Bangla, imagine you would be able to understand Tagore in the in the language that he wrote in. Right. Mm -hmm. You would be able to understand the cinema of Satyajit Ray in the language he made them. And I'm just saying there's just enormous things that open up. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are institutions and organizations in India who do this very well. Mm -hmm. The Indian Army, for instance, it's a natural institution that embraces this polyglotness of India, right? You will see many Indian army people are able to comprehend, if not speak and use 
multiple languages because mm-hmm. they're posted all over the place right uh, certainly indian diplomats right that's another uh, indian is officers you know because they're posted constantly here and there sometimes are able to do this among non governmental organizations you know i can think of many i'll give you one example the ramkrishna mission the monks of the ramkrishna mission again constantly traveling from temple to temple are able to often pick up you know mm-hmm. i have met many ramkrishna mission monks who are fluent in bangla the language of vivekananda mm-hmm. the language of sri ramakrishna the other organization that does this really well is the rss again if you talk to many of the rss people they're often posted very far away from their birth places to do, you know work in uh, you know rss pracharaks and so on and so forth they pick up this you know this ability to i mean i have met rss people who are from maharashtra and who speak fluent kashi mm. you know fluent ahomia of fluent odia right and that's because they spent many years in different parts of the country and picked it up so this is our natural inheritance and many organizations have this and i think many common people had this i think we have created this terrible boundary by embracing only english as our sole tool mm-hmm. right but remember you can never love your mother in somebody else's tongue that's so true you must remember this yeah. you can never hope to retain your sovereignty protect your motherland and indeed love your mother in a borrowed language yeah um i yesterday i when i was coming coming back to delhi from the airport my uber driver happened to be someone i uh, i i know the neighborhood that he belongs to so i was chatting with him he was uh, he was a rag to riches kind of a story right he built himself from scratch he says uh, because i uh, couldn't speak english my i insist that my kids speak only english at home their mother speaks english uh, so sometimes they're saying something to me and i can't understand but i'm very happy they're speaking english so and i said i gave him the otp in hindi you know hindi counting is something that i often do because i think most people from my generation are forgetting it he's like so sad sad is what then i had to tell him what it means yeah. so i was like this is the problem that on on one hand you have this upwardly mobile desire to be yeah an india that speaks english that yeah. understands the english world yeah. that can rub shoulders with giants across the world yeah on the other hand as an urban indian at the first sign of upward mobility you dismiss your heritage you you um, sort of leave hindi at the or whatever language you speak yeah. at at the shores of your proverbial uh, you know whatever like you you basically leave it and and as a result i know many of my friends who cannot read the mother tongue that they speak who can write it in the roman script but they cannot even comprehend what the hindi newspaper or the bangla newspaper says but this is a problem in hindi cinema for instance uh if you go again down south tamil actors or kannada actors you know or telugu actors or malayali actors they read their script in their original language mm-hmm. you know in their mother tongue hindi actors or hindi cinema actors prefer scripts written in you know the roman alphabet because they can no longer they are, but they're going to say the dialogues in hindi but they can no longer they don't retain the ability to read fluent hindi mm-hmm. right and this is the big challenge this is the big problem so we have uh, we are basically slowly becoming more and more deracinated and i do think and you know uh, in recent years there's been a push back you know i think a lot of people are pushing back against these ideas mm-hmm. but you know i remember when i wrote being hindu uh, there is the mother there is a mother of a dear friend of mine who told me that i'm really happy that you wrote this book and i said you know why auntie you know why why this particular book you know i've written other things so she said look i mean in my generation that is their generation we always thought the thing to do was to be like the west so we wanted to dress like them and speak like them and you know adopt their culture and you know uh, learn that you know in the in the in the spoons kept beside your you know plate you have to begin from the outside and move yeah. to the inside yeah, and British all of that right? classes exactly yeah. right and we tried to push our children to become world facing because we thought the opportunities would open up for them across the world yeah. india was not the place where opportunities were right what happened because of that is they not only went far away from the motherland per se they went far away from the culture mm. so therefore they never retained or they didn't retain sort of indigenous roots that would bring them back mm-hmm. right 
and today many of them realize that you know it's the feeling when you you know you really understand the void in your life when your parents are no longer there losing your mother culture is like that yeah one day you will wake up and realize what the void is you know one day and which is why nri populations feel this right mm. one day they wake up you know they have their american dream or european dream or whatever they have their suburban home and the right color dog and you know a bmw in their garage and blah 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 and one day they wake up one morning and they realize that something inside them is empty mm. right and what is that emptiness that emptiness is not because they're living somewhere else the emptiness is because they have cut the umbilical cord that attaches them and nourishes them from their home culture mm. yeah that is the reason why any you can be in yeah. any part of the world and if you're connected to your culture you'll be fine mm. but if you cut that umbilical cord like if you cut your ties with your own parents mm. one day you will wake up and feel that there is something missing yeah. it's the same thing you're going to be a drifter a mercenary yeah. someone like there's many many people who come to to a country like india if they've been excommunicated or expelled or um, they just want to leave and you can see that it's very hard when you're floating in the middle in between cultures i want to uh, go back to um, a road that we're very close to right now in delhi um shri aurobindo marg right and i have often frequented the famous club uh, called oro right which is a <laughs> which is derived from that But, see this uh, is the uh, you know it's immediately apparent vinamra that <laughs> how much younger you are than me because i immediately thought of the aurobindo ashram yeah. and you thought of the oro club you know this <laughs> just i mean the perspective <laughs> is immediately clear no the only so, reason i mention oro <laughs> is because i thought it was always funny that they they figured that they could just name it on the road right yeah. but I, i just know the name i have a vague inkling i understand yeah. who this man was but i have honestly I I completely confess to knowing little about him yeah. and what was his role in India's freedom struggle the freedom we now take for granted No Aurobindo is an incredible case I'm so glad we're discussing him uh Vinamra because it adds up to everything that we've been talking about till now Aurobindo was taught from the childhood to completely detach himself from his you know parental culture he was taught to be a uh, Englishman's Englishman so to speak Aurobindo was taught Latin. Aurobindo was taught, you know, European languages. Aurobindo was taught horse riding and this, that, all kinds of things, right? Now he may have not have been good at many of these things, but he was truly trained to develop what I would call a Western mind. Hmm. He was sent away very early to England to study and become a classic English gentleman, extremely refined. who understood western classical music and the western languages and understood greek and you know latin and so on and so forth was extremely well versed in the culture and the literature of the west that was the upbringing aurobindo was trained to be you know he was trained to be the englishman's englishman mm -hmm. and yet you know as you know as uh, you know aurobindo would say maybe uh, as the divine would have it aurobindo gave up all of that came back to india and became a revolutionary aurobindo was almost hung you know uh for his revolutionary activities which was uh well it was you know conniving against the empire violent acts you know plotting murder bombing all kinds of things he right? did all of that i he see he was part of the revolutionary group i see aurobindo as a spiritual figure mostly yes and yet what happened so he he spent time in prison he said that when he spent time in prison he saw vivekananda he had visitations as it were from swami vivekananda and he then began to feel that was his path was different so when he came out of prison aurobindo gave up revolutionary life for a higher cause and he said that the higher cause was for humanity to discover you know this higher spiritual purpose mm -hmm. he moved to pondicherry uh you know and then of course he met uh the person we know as the mother now uh, mm -hmm. who became his you know closest disciple confidant all kinds of things um and she then helped aurobindo build you know this entire uh, community called the oroville community um 
and you know a lot of that is the mother's work right uh, aurobindo actually also remember in pondicherry for large periods of time he would you know sink back in silence mm. you know he would not talk to anybody for long periods of time actually if you are ever interested vinamra aurobindo wrote some of the most lucid but very difficult to read and very it's very dense but but some of the most detailed explanations of how a normal human mind rises slowly to comprehend the you know the the extra natural so to speak or the uh, or the supernatural which is by which i don't mean you know ghosts and whatever i mean the sense that the, the in an upanishadic sense understanding the divine mm-hmm. right when that happens to a person how their mind and their consciousness opens up and what they feel and what they experience i think some of the most detailed notes mm-hmm. were written by aurobindo and they are most people cannot get into this because they are really uh they are very dense and they are very detailed and you know complex because complex things are happening to him right but aurobindo is one of the greatest examples of how our sense of nationalism is irretrievably intertwined with spirituality hmm. that's why vivekananda said the same thing you know i mean there could be there can be no nation without the spiritual heritage yeah and yet you find that uh, there's also people like subhash chandra bose of course right who um who essentially migrated out of india and raised their own army yes we why is it that his role in the independence movement is sometimes stifled by modern scholars so there are multiple reasons for this um, you know some of this is politics right uh, you know subhash chandra bose and his brother sarat chandra had a huge sort of quarrel with the the within the congress party you know they were prominent congress people and uh, their battle really was with gandhi patel and nehru mm-hmm. specifically you know patel they really did not like you know um uh, you know sharod bose and subhash chandra bose uh, particularly did not like patel because they thought sadar patel was doing injustice by you know trying to sideline subhash bose mm. because subhash bose was in a sense be- becoming even more famous and even more popular than gandhi really right and there is a letter there's a infamous letter that you know subhash chandra subhash chandra bose was actually in a sense thrown out of the presidentship of the congress party you know uh, and there is a whole history to this but subhash chandra bose really was one of the most dynamic you know influential popular figures of the congress until the you know uh, at least they argued this the congress you know especially led by gandhi and patel and nehru sidelined them now seen from the perspective of patel and you know gandhi they saw that subhash bose would not accept in its entirety gandhi's framework of non violence uh-huh because subhash bose said that well freedom is our birthright whatever takes us to freedom you say non violence will take us to freedom sure but perhaps there could be other paths to freedom also whereas gandhi nehru and patel ever since gandhi came into the picture were determined that non violence is the only path mm. right and therefore subhash bose was in a sense sidelined you know uh and sarat bose i told you the road this infamous letter complaining that you know patel was the you know the, the person who had sidelined subhash bose and so on and so forth but subhash bose remember was in uh, you know was in house arrest in kolkata and he disguised like shivaji escaped from aurangzeb's clutches subhash bose escaped from his british uh, captors clutches traveled via the land route went all the way uh you know to europe um you know met the enemy's enemy so to speak mm-hmm. um the access the, powers the, the access powers including of course uh the italians and the germans the nazi party now there because of his uh, you know his uh meeting people in the nazi party and i think he met hitler once and this is debated how many times he met hitler and so on and so forth but once certainly um and there also the meeting didn't go very well and yet uh you know the the left has used that often to say that you know he was fascist he was not fascist you know subhash bose was not fascist uh by any stretch of imagination but this canard has been spread uh 
mm-hmm. and it has been a useful canard because you know the congress also wanted to uh, sideline him the marxist also wanted to sideline him mm. imagine i'll tell you you know when subhash bose's statue was coming up you know the new statue a few years ago uh in in central delhi uh, at rajpath uh, at vijay path now <clears throat> uh so there a whole bunch of british people on twitter began to really complain saying oh india's putting a fascist person so the british also didn't like it right because you see if india begins to valorize people like subhash bose then we are valorizing our revolutionary history the british don't want us to know this history yeah. they don't want us to care about this history they want a history where you know the british were doing something and they were building railways for us and at some point we protested yeah. saying oh you know we will fast and we will do you know non violent protest the british in their you know their real uprightness said okay fine since you're protesting fine take back your country here you are we'll go bye bye then we stood in front of the cameras mount batten and then you know gandhi and nehru and all of them stood in front of the cameras you know put the flag up lo lo behold it was all happy that's the story the british want us to know right and this is a story that uh, quote and quote intellectuals after independence shoved down everybody's throat to do oh, you know non violent struggle this is not to diminish gandhi but don't misunderstand me mm-hmm. i am not somebody who d- wants to diminish or denigrate gandhi ji at all in fact i think gandhi's contribution will you know it has its own staying power yeah. it will be with us as long as the indian republic is there but gandhi and nehru and even patel are just one part of the story there are other parts of the story there's a naval revolt that happens off the coast of mumbai you know the city where that you have now adopted and the british get really frightened you know that's why they leave very quickly you know they were supposed to leave a little later mm-hmm. uh, they get frightened that imagine the british were the great naval power of their time right. if you can't even control the ships if you can't even control the navy there's no hope of controlling mm-hmm. india right so but therefore the british even today don't want us to valorize a subhash bose a savarkar a khudiram bose an aurobindo a prafullo chaki a master surya sen and one can go on and on you know all the great revolutionaries of india mm. right they don't want us to know these stories because they always want this you know whitewashed tale yeah. so to speak they wanted diplomatic victory that was done through talks and treaties as yeah, opposed to yeah and violence. you know uh, and then we uh, did non violent marching and then we made some salt and lo behold independence was given to us you know that's really not true so let's let's uncover the the violent unheard side of india's freedom struggles because i think uh since they've been so whitewashed with i'm sure like you said gandhi's efforts and everyone else's efforts are not to be denied but it's just events and documents and slow painful burn of protesting let's talk about the guys who actually you know took up arms and yeah and got revolutionary stuff done yeah i mean you know and the, and there are so many you know of course savarkar is now better known right mm. all the people who were rotting in kalapani prison right and remember in kalapani prison and this is how you know sadly modern indian historians have completely distorted the story right Savarkar is not the only one who was suffering there. Mm. There were people who called themselves Marxists also who were really suffering there, mm. right? But remember, those Marxists really loved their country. They wanted independence. They are not like the other so-called communists and Marxists we know who always look to China. They were not looking to China or Russia. They were looking to save their own country. Yeah. right and they were willing to go through unbearable torture i mean the torture that kalapani had you know for 16 hours you would be tied to wooden stakes and you know jo bail ghumate hai na you know the uh, in in the even even today if you go to villages uh when you get oil out of an oil mill mm-hmm. so you put the grain right and you have a yoke and you know there are yeah. stone grinders and the bullock goes round and round and round and round and the oil comes out that's how you know traditional oil press human beings were made to do that for 16 16 hours a day you know kalapani was incredible you you must go to kalapani you know go to andaban is it still and around of i mean it's now a museum of sort yeah. you should go to the cell of savarkar and see all that right most indians have no idea about all of this you know all this rubbish that people talk these days i mean they have no clue the sacrifices that were made um 
by the way this is one incredible story of the you know in bengal it's called the agni yug mm-hmm. the age of fire right, right. Uh, with all these great revolutionaries khodiram bose you know um again you know i get goosebumps talking about him you know barely a boy really not much more than a boy hardly must have been 16 17 18 whatever uh you know sang the, you know uh, in bengali he sang uh, agbar bidai de ma ghureashi supposedly right and which is basically let me go mother mai lot ke aaunga you know i'll come mm-hmm. back see now i can feel you know tears prickling and do you know what happened i mean there is uh, you know uh, th- this sort of revolutionary history this kind of sacrifice that people made and these were all boys i mean think of bhagat singh right i mean yeah. these were not more than young boys i have his uh, jail diary writings i suddenly randomly found the book it is insane it's incredible yeah so these were not more than young boys actually and they were willing to you know sing vande mataram up to the gallows this in entire history was wiped away in a sense right we never celebrated all of this you know savarkar you think of the torture on savarkar in in kalapani um and yet uh, you know for most part of indian history we have not been able to modern indian history we have not been able to valorize these people including yeah. including subhash bose who you mentioned right i mean why should the subhash bose statue you know facing parliament be controversial hmm. it is only controversial to the british who think of him as fascist it's very interesting that you often would go to uh, if you go to european towns or european cities in the squares the one statue you most often see is a conqueror or a general yes right they completely valorize the valiant the completely. violent right it's only here that we are only supposed to do it for shivaji we get we get one we get one national hero who fought using who used violence but you see even shivaji even shivaji would have been wiped out had it not been for the love that the marathis have for him mm. right remember and you you know this is the other thing the other thing that we've been misled on shivaji yes was a great maratha hero but do you know rabindranath tagore wrote about shivaji i had no idea Do you know Ravindranath Tagore believed that Shivaji should have been should be celebrated? So you know Maratha and Rajput valor was very much part of the 19th century nationalist mind in Bengal when this entire age of fire was happening. Hmm. Do you know that uh, one of the places where because the British were tracking these people uh, a lot a whole range of gymnasiums came up akharas and the revolutionaries would go to the akharas to exercise and they would pass chits of paper and say things to each other to pass message because everything else was being tracked in fact swami vivekananda his brother ran one of the akharas that's so interesting we, we the young vivekananda would go was going to one of these akharas one can't even imagine what it must feel like to be surveilled to that level completely so these akharas came up across bengal you know for young men to go and exercise that's why swami vivekananda is always saying that you know a strong body is really important not just a strong mind but also a strong body mm. because he comes from that milieu right he comes from that milieu where people are protesting he comes from the revolutionary fervor right i can't imagine being in that era and having someone else be your master as you yeah. figure out ways to um you serve the country back from them the country we now take for granted could you perhaps point to more uh freedom fighters or more i'd say violent uprisings that have been dismissed over time as a consequence of this this white washing that you so speak about you know there are many many stories um uh i'm i'm just looking you know i had made some notes to share with you and i'm just looking uh, mm-hmm. to see if i can uh find these but um but let me uh, uh, quickly go into some other things that i think are very important uh do you know that when the circus first came to bengal the circus was also used as a methodology because the circus would go to town to town from town to town was used as a methodology for passing revolutionary information which british police officers were who's posted where who's day to day 
you know uh, activities are what right at what point can they be attacked this would travel from town to town via circuses once they came to bengal i can wow it's like you're wearing a baklava you're hidden in sight and suddenly someone a revolutionary from yes. your city comes to visit you and you take them aside uh, to the circus grounds and you whisper and you ask about the the everyday doings of these it's it's like it seems to me like there was an entire spy network of course that's the only way they were able to you know raid the armory and shoot down you know british officers and who were torturing people i mean there's a reason why these young men were remember many of these young men had been trained in british institutions they mm. had been trained in schools opened by the british colleges opened by the british so they knew the british as much as the british knew see one of the great uh, uh, dislikes of the british i think even today is um, many of the people including gandhi nehru and patel who finally brought down the empire had been trained by the empire right they had all gone to england they studied to become barristers they had many of them studied in sort of you know schools and colleges started by the english these people who were trained to become the most loyal servants of the raj turned around and dug the dagger deep into the heart of the raj um and who is ulaskar datta yes and that's the name i was uh, you know I, i in from my notes that i i wanted to talk to you about uh ulaskar datta was this wonderful wonderful uh character from the agni yug so he was again a young revolutionary uh who was in love with bipin chandra pal's daughter mm mm-hmm. you know lal bal pal bipin right right right, right. and both of them were sort of revolutionary lovers until ulaskar datta sort of goes away you know revolutionary work and then is in prison when he comes out of prison he realizes that the girl has married somebody else he goes to the girl and really berates her and burns all the, the letters that they exchange in front of her and goes away years go by he doesn't get married he then hears that the that girl's husband has died and then she has been afflicted with a, with a terrible disease which has left her paralyzed part of her body he immediately rushes to her brings her to his house starts taking care of her gets married to her and they live and they get married in their 60s they get married to each other and live with each other for the rest of their lives it's one of the most incredible love stories uh, from the age of fire from the agni yug you know and i'm so glad uh, you asked me to uh, do this podcast and that allowed me to look through my old notes to you know re uh, find as it were the story and to share with you uh, yeah it's an incredible story so you know i think the reason i want to tell you the story is it also tells us that they were finally young romantic men they were not just people who wanted guns and were killing people and this and that. they were young romantic men who really believed in the love for the motherland who really believed that okay i will sing vande mataram they'll you know put a noose around me i'll die big deal i'll come back and i'll fight again right i think this is this context has been lost over time i mean i feel like our generations aren't half as brave as these men I feel like the stakes are so easy for us that I can't think of one 18 year old I know who will uh, you know go and do something heroic like that. This heroism has sort of turned from protecting and getting back your freedom to some kind of an internal revolution, kind of an internal like i- inner work kind of thing. But I want to put to you that um, you know look at what privilege has done and I I mean no disrespect people are entitled to their identities and so on and so forth. but what are we fighting for these days right i'm not sure what anymore. is our great battles our great battle is about whether what pronounced to put neg- against our name and again i am not saying that that's not important you know more power to people who you know feel that that's important mm-hmm. but look at the scale surely there's a difference of scale right i mean we are you know there's in in america there's a term snowflake right mm-hmm. I mean we are we have become a snowflake culture also the other thing i want to really talk to you about is you know we are becoming a non serious people that's very true the pakistanis for instance have become a non serious people 
their politics is also a joke people go to prison come out of prison everybody knows everybody is corrupt isi guy goes to afghanistan takes money something 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 now is being arrested they have become a unserious and non-serious people there's no central cause that unites no. them it's split look at the americans they are becoming a non-serious people their politics is becoming a joke mm. so i never want that part i think india is still india's indian politics is still you know to a degree serious indian society also is still unafflicted by some of the excesses of the west so we are still a serious people mm mm-hmm. but we run the danger of becoming a non-serious people how can we then sorry you were saying no and and this is this would be terrible for us because imagine we are the world's largest democracy imagine if our democracy becomes a joke uh-huh. right it, it's ridiculous it is absolutely ridiculous we have it's almost like we have no greater causes in our lives apart from which bathroom will be used by who yeah yeah i think it's um i mean there's also the idea that we have no great force to compete against we have no great battle to overcome so we just uh, sort of exist on the sidelines but i think that's so why it's a problem of privilege isn't it yeah maybe or or maybe it's just that we we've just been so our life in the modern world is so comfortable that we're not fighting for our very sovereignty anymore yeah. that sovereignty has has become pockets it's it's become pockets of personal revolutions as opposed to one united cause right it's it's sort of it's become it's become a global movement of indians taking office in different parts of the world i also don't understand why people really really uh project all kinds of hopes onto rishi sunak or anyone of indian origin who ends up in american office they assume that that's that person is going to change their lives and that you know never ends up happening i'm really glad you mentioned rishi sunak because it ties into what i was saying to you look at british politics it's a classic example of a non serious politics right look at the joke that their politics is for the last many years mm-hmm. prime minister after prime minister keeps popping up one prime minister comes the press says that she's like cabbage then everybody is looking whether she will outlast this cabbage mm. list trust you know there's some timer is put in front of cabbage yeah sorry yeah is the will the cabbage you know wilt away first or will the prime minister go another prime minister a complete joke during covid is partying and chugging alcohol with his people then boris johnson the, boris johnson yeah. then it becomes a big scandal then that is a scandal then everybody is talking about it then he's trying to lie about that scandal i mean is this the behavior of mature people the entire politics has become a joke new guy comes it's ridiculous now there are uh, riots happening all across the uk why because some guy went and stabbed three children three little girls who are of the age of 1 6 years 9 years and something mm-hmm. yesterday also somewhere in london some guy came and stabbed a woman and i mean their entire the police i mean the, uh, the funniest thing is when we were growing up in calcutta we used to read these old stories that the scotland yard and british police are some yeah. of the best in the world you know they are so good they're so tough and today the videos are full of mobs chasing and the british police running away mm. so it's a classic example of a society which has become a non serious society mm. right and you never want that to happen to your country as a post colonial nation what do you think hindal we can do to instill in us this kind of a sovereignty that colonial nations have always had like i often think the british was ruled by no one it was subjugated to no one it was just the british empire right we were never an empire if you if you uh, i mean like we were, we had many many different kingdoms we were never one indian empire like one one country under one man or one one uh, one head of state so as a post colonial nation what do you think we can do to completely eradicate this kind of subjugation that still if if the subjugation isn't uh, on a constitutional level that subjugation still exists in the minds of some of us who feel like that the west is superior that the white man is stronger and that freedom or that freedom or uh, expression must must come at the white man's terms 
So look, first we have to leave aside this idea that there was no India before 1947. This is a classic colonial trope. The British wanted to explain this to us so that if we understand and this is drilled into our heads, then again they'll be able to say, "Look, we gave you your country." Mm. Before the British there was no unified India. We unified your country. This is a classic colonial trope. Yes, we didn't have in fact even empires. We had the great Magadha empire, you know, uh, even the Mughal empire, you know, had a large swath and there are many, you know, you look at the Gupta Gupta period and so on and so forth. Mm. But what we had, you know, was the, what our great saints understood. We had pilgrimages through the footsteps of pilgrim our nation was defined. that's why the adi shankaracharya travels from shrine to shrine north east west south it is through the footsteps and those shrines mm-hmm. that the commonality cultural commonality of india comes through right long before you know um the islamic invasions long before the british came to india the commonality of india was never political the mm-hmm. commonality in india was always spiritual that's why you have you know Vaishnavism in the south, in the east, in the north, in the south. You have Shaivism in the south, in the east, in the north. It is that's why every great saint of ours walked the length and breadth of our country. Think about the Adi Shankaracharya. Think about Swami Vivekananda. Length and breadth of the country, right? That there is a inherent unity in the country, mm-hmm. and that unity. You think of any great spiritual master in our country. They have always argued that the unity of our country was built not using the sword, not through political power, but through the footsteps of pilgrims, through the idea of spirituality that connected us from north, south, east, and west. Today in our conversation, you've mentioned the word motherland a lot. Yeah, I often. read about the word motherland in books yeah. and usually books about patriotism and indian history yeah but i don't hear motherland in common parlance i don't yeah. i don't hear my friends talk about india our motherland that that idea of of treating the country as a mother or instilling it with this kind of a matriarchal pride is so rare that when you talk about it you you rise up from looking at india as an economic power as a soft power you cease to look at it in geopolitical terms and it becomes a personal it becomes a personal relationship with with um with the landmass that you occupy it it moves away from from the strictly geopolitical the strictly diplomatic to an otherworldly ethereal country that that you belong in and and that's the that's the sort of thing i uh, i will take away from from today's conversation Um, no, but that's very important. Let me say this. Um, this is what we have missed, right? Look, one of the great things that the West wants to teach us is that communities mean nothing. The family means nothing. Every the, the extreme capitalism and extreme co- communism has one thing in common: the family means nothing. Everything is the state. Mm-hmm. you're an individual you have a relationship with the state right whereas the indian way of looking at it is that the family is at the center of everything community is at the center if only you think of your you know your country as the motherland you will step out of your home in mumbai and say look look at the state of our roads why don't we fix it this cannot be done only by government i am not trying to say government doesn't have a role of course government has a huge role mm-hmm. and you know city should have their elected government it's a whole different conversation mm-hmm. about how civic uh you know behavior should be fixed but if people care about their country they will care you know tell me in delhi why can't we fix this one problem that the air has become difficult to breathe in winter yeah we can't because nobody cares we keep saying government will do it but the people do not take you ask the farmers of punjab also and haryana also and they will say oh we are also breathing the same thing you're also dying i mean yeah. it makes no sense so that sense that this land belongs to us and it's where we come home you know this is the land where we come home unless we instill instill these values to newer generations the future of india is bleak but i have great faith because i think there is a renewal of all these ideas in the, all these ideas and more and more younger people are willing to listen like yourself for instance and i do hope you know through them a new generation and multiple new generations 
will understand why India is important. Look, India is a unique country. I want to leave this thought with you. Think about it. All the ancient empires and civilizations are gone. Mm -hmm. Rome is gone, right? Egypt is gone. Uh, Egypt is gone. All of this is gone. The only civilization that remains unbroken is India. How do we know that? The Gayatri Mantra you might be saying in your house, your mother might be saying in your house today was said at the banks of Kashi 5,000 years ago. That's our unbroken tradition. And if we lose that, it's much more than any material loss. So people have to understand that what are we defending? We are not defending some landmass alone. We are defending an unbroken civilizational culture. Mm -hmm. And that culture belongs to each person in India. It doesn't matter what language they speak, what they wear, what they eat, what is their religion. doesn't matter. It's a common heritage. Yeah, I think we should move. We often see ourselves as citizens. And we, we often see India from the lens of civics, right? And when you're talking about roads, um, we often complain as citizens. But if we were to look at the country as our mother and we, were, we would become its sons and daughters, the conversation would be entirely different. It would become a conversation that perhaps our predecessors who gave us the independence, they would be having a conversation like that. Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I wish everyone a happy Independence Day. When this episode comes out, it's Independence Day. And uh, Hindal, you are perhaps... Yes, the... I want to wish all your uh, uh, listeners and viewers a very happy Independence Day too. Yeah. And um, of course, I, I hit you up because you're the one person who's an encyclopedia on all things India and revolutionaries. And I'm glad you told these stories. And uh, honestly, I've uh, it's been a while since I've had goosebumps on the podcast. I've had those multiple times today. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope I keep seeing you uh, in our beloved nation again and again and again. I would love to and it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.